How you going guys, my name's Jonesy and today we're diving into something a little bit unfamiliar and probably unknown to you and that is KCAR Global. Now, what KCAR Global is, is a 24 hour key car endurance race which is set in Sepang, Malaysia. Now you're probably wondering, what was I doing there? Well, I managed to secure a once in a lifetime opportunity behind the wheel in exchange for some content, which for someone like me who's into cars and pursuing a career in motorsport racing, I'd be crazy to turn down the offer. Let's go racing. The experience was a roller coaster of highs, lows, and learning curves. And even though filming every moment wasn't possible, I filmed as much of the adventure as I could. So buckle up and join me as I share how it all unfolded. On today's episode, something new, something different. I am here in Malaysia. I've been here for a couple of days now. And today I'm going to the Sepang F1 circuit with the people I'm with, with my team, with some mates. And why are we here? Why am I going to the F1 circuit in Sepang? Because I am racing in KCAR Global. And I'm here to film content as well. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a whole thing. It's a 24 hour race. It's the only KCAR race in the entire world. And I get to race in it. It's gonna be sick. Anyway, let's go suss out Malaysia in this race and see what it brings. This is actually my second time in Malaysia. Now the last time I was there, it wasn't so much a holiday. Myself and a group of people that I was in Malaysia with left the resort we were staying at and headed straight to the Sepang circuit where the team from Harakars who we were partnered with had already taken the cars out of the container and were working on them to get them ready for the race. The car I was racing was a Suzuki Cappuccino. They are a Japanese key car fitted with a double overhead cam, 657cc engine, along with a tiny little turbo. And they only weigh 725 kilos. However, this one probably weighed a little bit less as the whole entire interior had been stripped. One of the many characteristics about this car was not just how tiny it was, but the wide body kit that Harakars had put onto it, which is showing its fair share of battle scars. And the wing fitted to the back of the car, which is chassis mounted, definitely added a lot of downforce, I would say, which aided in the handling and performance of the overall car. Now, the Zuzu Cappuccino also happens to be owned by the uh, founder and operator of KCAR Global and Hara Cars, Yoshiyuki Hara. Most of the day was spent getting the car ready and prepared for the event and making sure that people could actually fit in the car. Some people that I was there with were uh, a bit larger and couldn't fit in the car and generally speaking, Suzuki Cappuccinos are a small car. So if you're of a decent sized build, or even if you're tall, you're gonna struggle fitting in. And by the time you put your helmet on as well, my head was just touching the roof. And I'm tall, I guess, but I'm not fucking huge. We make a moral of you. Wow, the cool thing as well is while we were there getting everything ready there are actually other cars on the track there was like ferraris there was porsche and there are actually two gr yaris's which is cool didn't expect to uh, see them over there So I'm currently walking the pit lane of the Sepang F1 circuit, taking some photos, checking out the cars. And there's actually quite a few here. It's, uh, it's a whole experience. I've never seen so many modified key cars in my life. There's some over there and they're just they're everywhere. And you're gonna see more of it. To think that at this track is where they hold actual Formula One events and I'm about to race on this same track. It's pretty surreal. In the afternoon, we'll call up to the main office to do the sign ups, you know, sign all your documents and Get your little ID card if you get them just registered. Officially got my little tag, I think it's for the team I'm on. I'm gonna go down and film some content and we'll go. And Yoshiki Hara was there and he politely asked slash told us in Japanese, which was translated for us, uh, please do not break or crash my car. <laughs> which did not happen. <clears throat> Spoiler alert, the car was fine. Yeah. 
In the evening uh, was when we had the compulsory driver's briefing and that was relatively long, like not too in depth. Like it wasn't very strict to the FIA standard or like some events in Australia, but it was still things like, you know, the layout of the event, a rough timeline, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, actions on this, rules you shouldn't break. Unfortunately, I broke a few of those. Uh, and the final bit was like the team leader would go up and draw a number out of a hat. And basically whatever number you drew was your grid position. And I'm pretty sure ours was last. Well, was Oscar, you're the second driver. Yeah. Yes, and sir. who's been decided to drive in the rain? This guy. Me, <laughs> this I'm guy. driving in the rain. <laughs> It was nearly start of the day, had to get to the racetrack around quarter to six for the photo shoot at six o'clock. So it's the morning of the race and Oscar is down there stretching out because apparently doesn't do early mornings. And I've got a photo shoot this morning, like a, I don't know, but everyone does it. And then after that, get fuel, another briefing, some sort of ceremony, and then we race. I'm currently walking just straight up the Sepang circuit up to Turn 15, where we're gonna take the big group photo. This is actual so cool. Basically, it's a big group photo shoot that they do at the top end of the racetrack of all the teams together before the race starts. Even though it was like, uh, <laughs> Herding cats, everyone got there eventually and <laughs> the photo got taken after a few attempts. They took the photo, told everyone to go. They're like, no, come back, come back. I had to like line everyone up and <laughs> do it all again. Now the blood pressure is definitely starting to rise as the clock is ticking closer and closer to the 12 p.m. start. Before the open ceremony and the beginning of the race, we all got a 30 minute slot to basically take the cars out, test them for drivers to get used to the track, learn the track, or the car, which for me, it was uh, all of the above. Now, some teams were pretty quick to get on the track straight away, while others made a few tweaks here and there. We eventually got out and I eventually got in the driver's seat. And it was no racking, you know, going out, but as soon as I was out on the track, it was it was fun. I was fucking excited. Very chaotic, because there's cars everywhere, uh, you know, trying to get their laps in, you know, test this, test that. But it was good. I got used after like probably the first lap or two was a bit slow, and then I finally started to get the hang of it. Lines were sloppy, laps were sloppy, but I mean, it's my test lap. I ended up getting like a three minute 30, which the guy from Haras said is pretty decent, because especially from like an endurance perspective, because the car, uh, the race is an endurance race, not a time attack race. <laughs> we'll come back to that uh, statement later in the video. Bro, I just raced the cappuccino around for a practice lap. It is the fucking best car. Shit's on Skyline for handling. Like, corners you think you need to slow down, you don't, you just plant it. It's actually the best. Unfortunately, the placement of the GoPro on my helmet was uh, pretty average. So a lot of the footage is just looking at a dash cluster, but there's some stuff in there that is it's pretty cool, <laughs> especially when I had some incidents. Okay. But yeah, the feed of the cappuccino is actually tracked through GPS. Actually, all the cars were to track the GPS, which comes up on a TV screen that we had in the pits. Basically shows all these little dots with like car numbers going around the circuit and then you go to a different screen and it tells you each car, their number, their class, how many laps they've done, their time, their best, like the breakdown and so on. Now the test laps are over and now we're off to refuel. We're ready for the race to start in about an hour. So the boys are here refueling. Oscar, 
How much are you putting in? Oh, one million liters. One million liter. <laughs> one million. Uh, all right, so he's talking shit, but they're refueling. We can't put all of it in because there's limits of how much fuel you can put in per certain time. And we have 270 liters of fuel that we have to conserve over the 24 hours. So it'd be like softer driving during the daytime and at night time because it's cooler, we better get to send it a little bit more. After this, I don't know what's going on, but I'm keen, it's gonna be fun. And I just wanna get back out there because oh, it was so much fun. This, this thing's a rocket, honestly. I will be making one and I will be entering 2025, controller. <laughs> Music was blaring down the pitch straight as teams pushed their cars into position, took photos in front of them with their families, with their mascots, or just as a group as a whole. Honestly, the whole thing was a vibe. Here we go! Now how they start the race is different. All the mascots line up on one side of the pitch straight and then on the pit side of the pitch straight is where you have all the cars angled up in their grid order. And when uh, I think it's like a buzzer or whistle goes off, the mascots have to run as fast as they can to the car to pull the tag off. Now, I would have thought you'd just send it afterwards, but apparently once the tag's pulled off, you just creep out at walking pace to maintain the good sequence that you're supposed to be in. And then you just follow the safety car around once and then off you go. <laughs> Even though I wasn't back in the driver's seat for a couple of hours, there's still stuff to do, like help with refueling or driver changes when they happen, or just watch the cars go around on the screen, watch them overtake each other here and there. <laughs> Honestly, I was so pumped to get back in the driver's seat. Like, oh, and once I did, it was, it was on. It was fucking game on. better lap times, I was quicker on the track, but due to obviously my inexperience and I've been on the, in the track for a very long time, my lines were sloppy and my driving was pretty intense, but not really efficient, if you could say. So like because it rained as well, turn nine caused me a lot of grief. Turn 9 caused me a lot of grief. At first it was due to the wet. I actually uh, spun out once. Uh, and then time and time again after that, there was a bit of slippage here and there. And later on in my session, I think the session went for about 45 minutes. I was doing pretty good actually. Against good times. And I think it's turn 12. I had a big spin out.
which honestly took me by surprise. Uh, and when the car took a few cranks to turn on, I got pretty worried because I'm like, fuck, please just, just start. That, that would be the worst thing, not just for the car to not work, but be the person that caused it. After that, I uh, turned it back a fraction and just focused more on lines and technique and obviously getting the car around the track. There wasn't actually much long in my session after that. And when I pulled in, I was given some feedback to uh, <laughs> turn it back a fraction, which is fair enough. But then also Yoshiyuki Hara actually spoke to me and gave me some perspective like in com comparing general racing, I guess you could say, to endurance racing, which is like in a 24 hour race and how you know you can want to go for a quicker lap, you know, you brake later, harder, accelerate earlier, that kind of thing. Where the way he explained it, I'm not sure how to put it into words, because honestly, he just, he did it pretty good, uh, is you use your brakes to like conserve your fuel. So like you're coming to the corner, you brake a fraction, so you can kind of just like swing all the way around in like a nice methodical motion. Now, throughout the entire night, I tried to stay up as much as I could. I think I had about an hour's rest, which honestly I felt worse after I woke up than before. I went back out behind the wheel around 2.30 in the morning, and honestly, driving at night is so much better. Number one, because it's not as hot, but honestly, it's, <laughs> it's kind of peaceful. Like, it's just you, the car, and the track in front. I don't know, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was fucking something else. After some reflection from my day session and some feedback that I got, I spent the first probably third of my session just focusing on my lines, not going as quick while still sticking to the rev limiter. And I know this is probably not gonna make sense, but you know, the more you do something, the better you get at it. I find a lot of things like that we know, but we don't properly understand. Going slightly slower, but focusing on my lines, focusing on certain corners that I struggle with, trying different lines, going wider, going more narrow, and lap by lap by lap, I kept getting consistent times and then progressively quicker. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting confident, I'm getting better. So I started upping the pace, upping the speed, and then I started getting PBs while not like putting any I suppose, additional strain to what I was earlier on in the day. Like I was actually being more efficient with my driving. Now, one big mistake I did make was literally two minutes after getting into the car during one of my night sessions. And honestly, I don't know what was going through my mind or how I managed it, 
whether it was excitement to get back out on the track or just I somehow forgot, but I forgot to refuel. Now, the issue was I was driving forward and I realized halfway between the bollard, like the little bollard bit where you turn to go get fuel and go out to go on the pits. Oh, fuck. And you can't use reverse gear in the pits. And I knew this, I paused for, I don't know how long it was, I was thinking like, fuck, 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 like, like you know, losing time. And I'm like, oh, I just stopped, like, do I, do I go around one lap and then come back in? Or do I just <laughs> risk it and just whip her in reverse and go to the fuel? Which is what I ended up doing, which did cause another penalty. But afterwards, I was out on the track and all was sweet. There's all the smoke behind me, so I think something in an engine's blown. Because all your smell is oil, man. like that's fucking everywhere. Go! One thing that actually blew my mind about this Suzuki Cappuccino is how it handled. Like this thing was on tracks. Turn five and six, a really wide, long sweeping bend to the right and then to the left. Like once you got your line right and you can pretty much fight for it because you know the car's not making heaps of power, but you get some speed and because it's sticking and you've got a good line, you can literally feel like the blood in your head, like moving from side to side as you go from one across the other. Honestly, it's, it's fucking cool, man. Come the morning after a few incidents on the track and a long night of driving, the race was slowly approaching the finish. So it's been a very, very long night and it's I think 7.30 now in the morning. Uh, it's been a day, it's been a night. There's about four hours of the race left. There's currently a safety car. One of the cars which broke down was ours. Now, thankfully, it wasn't anything major. It was just a fan belt, but, and obviously with an older car in a different country, is you need to source them. Now, they had some, they had two actually, two belts, and after about half an hour of feeling them around, trying to get them to fit, of course, one was way too big and one was too small, they managed to get them on, but then I had to push that the car to get it going. But then, once he was started, the man, the myth, the legend, Yoshiyuki Hara, was all suited up and ready to bring it home for Hara cars. As the race got close to the end and the clock ticked down, everyone piled against the pit lane fence, watching their teams pass, cheering, carrying on. I think one of the cars are just on limiter bashing it down the entire pitch straight. Because if the car blows up, it doesn't matter. You finish the race now, so just send it. <laughs> Long after the final car crossed the finish line, people filled the pit lane. All the cars lined up. People were celebrating, cheering. It was, it was pretty damn cool.
Overall, it was an amazing and life-changing experience and I'm definitely glad that I did it. Despite the ups and downs on the overall trip, it definitely helped give me some clarity and I got a lot of experience to help in the pursuit of my career in motorsport racing. Honestly, you have to do it. It's it's fun and it's it's different. Like yes, yeah, Skylines and big cars, they're quick cars, they're, they're cool, they're fast, they're fun, but they're a different kind of fun, right? But key cars, they're something completely different. Like it's, it's honestly, it's a whole new world. And you might need like a dollar or two, I'm like pretty sure entry fees like two and a half grand per driver and ship your car over there, it's probably around $8,000. But trust me, it's worth it. Just get that loan now, don't get the loan. But do it, it's, I highly recommend it. Huge thank you to Hara Cars, Yoshiyuki Hara for letting <laughs> me drive his car and the group of people I was with, I really appreciate it and they made it happen, that they made this experience and journey possible and for that I'm grateful. Now, fun fact, while there have been Australian Japanese, Australian Malaysian hybrid teams, to this date there has never been a pure Australian built car and team that is shipped to and entered in the K-Car Global Endurance event. So my question to you is, will you be the first? One more time, oh, one more time, one more time. You're just embarrassing me time. now, are you? <laughs> one more time. It's going to be better than better. All right, let's go. Racing. Let me guess again. Yeah! yeah. <laughs>